Okay, thank you all for coming back after uh, a nice lunch and, an, and a nice break. And I hope that the uh, experiment session was worthwhile and, and interesting. So I'm going to pick up with my next topic out of 10. And uh, Rana and I are, have been talking about, okay, how our talks are interdigitating together. And I hope that continues to, to, to go well. The topics will be parallel uh, treatments at different levels of, of depth and, and detail. Uh, Okay, so the, so the title of, of uh, my lecture right now is Interactions of Waves and Detectors. And what that means I want to do is try to be a little more careful than I was this morning about what it means to measure uh, a, a gravitational wave passing through an apparatus. I kept showing diagrams where from a bird's eye view you were seeing what was happening to masses. But we don't observe the motions of the masses from a great height like a bird. Instead, there is this interferometer, and I want to walk us through um, how, how that works in, in some detail. Um, and this will be the, the closest that, that I come this week to talking like a relativist, which isn't very deep. So I hope uh, the people who, who know that physics better than I will will forgive me if I, if I stray a bit outside uh, my expertise. I hope I get it, get it right, though. Um, and I'm also hoping to then spend a little time outside the tiny bit of mathematics I'll do talking about questions of interpretation. And this is something where my struggles to make sense of the relativity have led me to, to understand what's subtle about connecting the mathematics of relativity with uh, interpretations of, ex of experiments. Uh, you, you'll see more. I, let me not speak in more general terms than that uh, now. Okay, so I want us to look at um, how an interferometer responds to a gravitational wave, how that signal ends up coming out as a measured phase. And when we're done with that, I want to raise and then dismiss, I hope it, um, uh, convincingly, uh, a question that occurs to everyone who's thinking hard about this. Namely, the question of, is the interaction between the gravity wave and the interferometer only with the freely falling masses, or does, it, does the gravity wave interact with the light in the instrument? And if it does, and it does, how does that change, if at all, how we understand how, how an interferometer works. All right, so here is a reminder of the, uh, the, the most high-level thought experiment version of how you would see a gravity wave. We stared at this a lot this morning. Um, there's that transverse quadrupolar strain applied to a set of freely falling test masses. Now. How we actually are going to measure the separation from here to here, or better, the separation from here to here, is what I'd like us to look at now. And um, here's where I want to, to emphasize something that I mentioned this morning, namely that um, to give an operational meaning, a, a meaning in terms of the description of a measurement you can actually do um, of what is the distance from this freely falling test mass to that one, you need to work through the mathematics of what is the round trip light travel time from one test mass to another. And that's the sort of thing that uh, when we learn our special relativity, we learn about making a light clock, or we learn about Einstein's insight that because the speed of light uh, is always uh, the number C, you can think through how uh, clocks are synchronized and think how they're synchronized on a moving train. All this stuff about using light travel time as the way to give meaning to the concept of distance has a deep relativity pedigree. Um, in spite of that fact, Einstein misunderstood his own theoretical prediction of relativity and spent years if not decades of his life convinced that in 1916 he'd made a mistake in announcing that gravity waves were real. 
And it was only in 1956 that Felix Pirani, in a sense, repeated the application of Einstein's own insight about um, the uh, use of light, and in particular measuring round trip light travel times, in order to show that gravity waves were real and to lead directly to at least we Ray Weiss's path to proposing uh, interferometers as, as detectors. And if you read what I've sometimes called the most important unpublished paper in 20th century experimental physics, namely Weiss's 1972 progress report of the stuff that was going on in his research group, where over the course of 30 pages, he lays out not only the idea of an interferometric interferometric detector of gravitational waves, but makes a list of almost every one of those noise sources that Rana had on his, on his graph. There were a few missing, and some were important, but it, and so, okay, that's fine too. Um, but still, it, I, st I still sit in amazement that sitting at his desk, which is something that Ray doesn't do as happily as sit at a lab bench, he was able to predict the future course of the struggle of building these machines. Boom, 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 we have to listen, worry about these things. Okay, but where did Ray get his relativity? Where did he understand that the interferometer would work if only he could conquer, see the way to conquer this list of 10 noise sources? It was from having read a paper of Felix Perani's in 1956. And that bit of history is sort of almost lost and it's one of my campaigns to, to resurrect our, our appreciation for for, for this work. And so I'm going to walk you through the calculation that Ray did following Felix's paper. So first, a, a reminder of relativity. I'm going to start with special relativity. And the reminder that perhaps the, the most important deep idea of relativity is that it is the interval ds squared between two space-time events that is the firmest description of their relationship to each other. The thing that is invariant under, under changes of coordinates. So here is the flat space-time metric that we learn about in special relativity. Uh, it says that the, the interval between two space-time events is minus c squared times the, the, the uh, square of the time difference between these uh, closely neighboring events, plus then the sum of the squares of the spatial coordinate distances. And I'm going to use this matrix notation just to make things compressed. I won't use it very much, but or this tensor notation, excuse me, oops. So, so let's rewrite this expression, which is what I always revert to when I need to do something with this compressed reminder that says, we can summarize this uh, statement with a shorter looking statement that the, uh, that the square of the interval is this tensor um, called the Minkowski metric times uh, the product of dx mu and dx nu. And there's this ultra compressed notation that's traditional in relativity where whenever you have a term that has an index twice, you're supposed to draw in in your head, but it's impolite to write it down, a summation sign over mu going from 0 to 3. And since mu is double and nu is double, there's actually two summation signs, summing over index mu and nu from 0 to uh, each from 0 to 3. And that's just uh, uh, because the Minkowski metric is this simple, only has these terms on the diagonal, it still amounts to this, this statement. Raise your hand if you've, if you've seen this much relativity before. Okay, most but not all. Okay, so I, I, maybe, maybe it's even helpful as a reminder for some of the people who raised their hands. Now, we're talking about a gravitational effect, so I can't just live in the world of special relativity. I have to move to general relativity, uh, the relativistic theory of gravity. And uh, general relativity has a statement that looks almost the same for the interval between two uh, for the interval between two space-time events, except the metric tensor is in general not just this simple object minus plus plus plus, but instead 
depending on the physics you're describing, has some more interesting structure. And the only general relativistic metric I'm going to introduce is the one that adds gra a gravitational wave to flat space. So don't worry, you're not, I'm not going to try in 10 minutes to tell you everything about GR. I, I couldn't even if I thought it was my role, which it's not. But we do need to say, OK, we've got this extra gravitational effect uh, added to flat space time, the, uh, the existence of a gravitational wave propagating through the flat space time. So we have to find what it is that, in what way, the, the metric that describes that situation differs from, uh, from the flat space metric. So now here is the answer. I'm not going to derive it for you. I'm just going to state it that the, the, the full metric that includes a gravitational wave traveling in flat space-time is the sum of the flat space-time metric plus uh, a small perturbation. And for all the physics we're going to talk about, it's laughably small. Amplitudes of 10 to the minus 21, those num that's a number that everyone would agree is small compared with 1. And the form of... Uh, of perturbation to the metric that describes a gravitational wave is this form. It's not the most general, but it is the most general if I um, restrict to the case of waves traveling along z the z direction. So if we call the coordinate direction z the one on which the gravitational wave is propagating, then we can't have any fancier gravitational wave than one described by these two per uh, this small perturbation where A is one small parameter and B is a second small parameter. So two parameters, that's either an obvious statement or a hint that we're talking about two polarizations of gravitational waves traveling along the Z direction. All right, I like pictures better, so here's a picture. This is the polarization that we looked at before, but it's not the only polarization. Still, it's my favorite one. It goes by the name of the plus polarization, and usually we write it uh, H plus with a little hat to say it's a basis tensor. And so this is the one where A and minus A are on the diagonal. Now, here I've written it with a minus one, but by the time uh, for, this, for this basis tensor, but by the time we actually make a metric, this is going to be multiplied in front by a really tiny number, like 10 to the minus 22. And this is the, dis is the mathematical description of lengthening along the x direction with simultaneous shrinkage um, along the y direction. Okay? So x and y, x and y. Here is the orthogonal polarization. And it's orthogonal even though the effect is rotated by 45 degrees. That's what makes it quadrupolar. And you can convince yourself that a distortion rotated by 45 degrees does nothing all along either x or y. So that's the, the physical meaning of saying it's orthogonal, that there is no net separation uh, one way or the other along the x and y direction, only along the diagonals of the coordinate system. And I like to think of this in terms of this diagram, but every once in a while we have to write mathematics. And so here is the, the basis tensor corresponding to that pattern. It goes by the name of the cross polarization, and it's written this way. So if we want to describe a gravitational wave in, that's traveling along the z direction, once we have these, these uh, two, two uh, fundamental bases for perturbations, we can describe the whole thing and we can understand the complete, uh, the complete metric. Now, we pick a set of, of coordinates by laying out an L-shaped Michelson interferometer. And I don't know anyone in his or her right mind who wouldn't call this X and call this Y and then suddenly I've invented something that's looking for the plus polarization and is blind to the cross polarization. So I was being a little hyper sophisticated for what I have to do for the rest of this lecture because from now on I'm only going to talk about the arrival of a wave from above 
So here's x, here's y, here's z. Now, of course, in the real world, gravitational waves can come from whichever direction. So I'll only walk us through the mathematics of the simple case. It's the only thing that's appropriate in, in this sort of format. But you can surely, with a little more care than I think is appropriate to, for us to all do together, you can handle by uh, very similar to methods to what I'm going to show you the case for a wave coming from an arbitrary direction with an arbitrary polarization. But let's, let's leave that extra math for, for something offline and just work our way through, uh, through the most straightforward case because it's interesting enough and, and rich enough. So we're looking for something that's, how do we understand the response of this system to a gravity wave coming along the z direction with the, with the plus polarization? So there's one other bit of relativistic physics that I want to remind people of, and that is what is the interval between two events that are connected by having a single ray of light connect both one and the other? And the answer is any two, any two uh, events that are struck by the same flash of light have an interval of zero between them. Raise your hand if you've heard this before. A few fewer hands. OK, so let me say it with more authority. <laughs> if a flash of light is emitted and it passes one spatial point at one time and then another spatial point at a later time, the interval by the rules of relativity between those things is zero. That is to say, um, that's precisely the meaning of this negative sign here in minus c squared dt squared. It's precisely so you can say, oh, well, it went this distance in this amount of time, appropriate to the speed of light, and I add them up together with this negative sign, zero, boom. Okay, So that's the key fact of relativity that's going to let us relate where events happen in space when they happen in time, given that we're talking about the motion of light between, between one event and another. OK, so, so that's the deep statement about what light is doing in relativity. And now I just get to write down the rest of what the metric says. And for now, I get to do one other simplification. I'm going to first analyze as far as I can go just thinking about what's happening in the X arm. Then I'm going to analyze what happened to the light that goes in the Y arm. And then I'm going to remember that the way a Michelson interferometer works is after the light has been split at the beam splitter into a beam that does this and a beam that does this, the light is superposed again. And I'm going to write down how you see the comparison between the two and that comparison made by superposing the two beams at the beam splitter is where the measurement finally happens. Okay, so here is a statement about two events along that X arm that if they're separated by a coordinate separation of dx, they're going to have a time separation dt such that this combination is zero where h11 is the amplitude of, of the gravitational wave, at least of the part that is lined up with the, um, uh, with the x arm. And I'm being too hyper subtle here. I should, I should have erased 1, 1. We're really talking about h plus, the, just the amplitude of, of, the, of the plus component here. OK, so we've got enough information here to learn a lot about what happens to that, to that uh, light, uh, the light that goes down the X arm. So let's see how we use it. Um, here I've rewritten that expression again. And I want to pause to say that this H can in principle have any time dependence we want. Depends on what source of gravitational waves made H. But for now, it could be arbitrary, but to make the math simple, I want us to take the case where 
the, time, the, the changes of H with time are slow enough that I can ignore them for the amount of time it takes light to go down the arm and back. We can and we must be able to relax that assumption if we're going to understand uh, the response of, of, high fr of an interferometer to waves of high enough frequency. But again, to make the maths uh, uh, simple enough to, to walk through it clearly, I want to temporarily say H is changing slowly, where by slowly I mean slow compared with the light travel time through the, through the arms. And then we can come back and see, see, what, see, see what happens when we go to a more general case. All right, so here we are. We're going to treat H as, as a quasi-constant. And now what I'd like us to do is get the expression for T on one side of an equal sign and the part, the term involving X on the other so we can find a relationship between X and T. So I think even though this is really simple algebra, I want to just display it on the whiteboard since we have a whiteboard and pen. So if I write as, do we need the lights up or? Well, let's start. Okay, so let's say I want Thanks. Okay. Now, did I correctly move things on opposite sides of the equal sign? I think I did, and then I multiplied everything by minus 1 to make minus signs go away. Okay. That's a good start. But there's something ugly here dt is squared and dx is squared. And I'm going to want to integrate up t and x. That's no good. Got to take the square root of this, right? OK, so far so good. This side is easy. This side is not quite so easy. I'd rather not have a square root sign there. I don't know. I don't like, I don't like integrating square roots where h is the interesting thing. So I'm going to propose that we use the binomial expansion of the square root of 1 plus a small quantity. OK. Is that the answer that I got? Yeah, now we're close. All right. Sorry if this is ridiculously, boringly um, easy. Now I'm going to integrate. Integrate. Did I get the same answer? Yeah. Oh, a miracle. All right. So I promised this morning that I was going to mention where the factor. Oh, thanks, Sandal. Um, where the factor of two comes from in the relationship between delta L over L and H. And it's here in having that square, having this start with squares and needing to take a square root and then saying, well, if ever there was a problem where the binomial expansion was good enough, it's where uh, my thing that's this added to 1 is 10 to the minus 22. Okay? So, so, so this is the, is the 2 that shows up in H equals 2 delta L over over L. All right, so this, I wrote integral signs so that we can start talking about events with finite separations and not really tiny separations between them. So we can actually sum up and say how much time elapsed for the light to go all the way from the beam splitter to the end test mass X and then back from ETM X to the beam splitter. And you can see that there's going to be, so that's going to be from 0 out to capital L, the length of the arm. And you can see that there's, the main effect is that the light still basically takes what you would think is the light travel time from the beam splitter out to uh, ETMX, namely, 
how long it takes for light to go four kilometers, but then there's this tiny perturbation corresponding to the statement that that arm is stretched. And this little extra part of this integral is h times l over 2c. So that is the part of the light travel time. Um, oh, actually, this, this integral just went down. We haven't gone back yet. This is the integral down. So h times l over 2c is the extra time coming from the fact that that arm is stretched, assuming that h1 is positive here. OK. Sorry if I'm taking this way too slow, but I don't get the right answer if I don't go this slow. All right. Now, I want to pause for an interpretational statement. I said we're integrating from 0 to L and not to anything else. In other words, I'm making the statement that my coordinates are marked, are defined by the positions of freely falling masses. And that's, it's easy to say, but it's sort of a, it's a non-trivial statement. Um, and so what that says is in this way of describing the world that n test mass did not move, nevertheless, there is a longer distance between it and the beam splitter than when a gravitational wave was not present. And the fancy name for this coordinate system is the transverse traceless gauge. So in this way of describing things, ETMX is always a distance L from the beam splitter. But still, there's something to measure. All right, so back to the calculation. We're going to bounce the light off that mirrored surface on n test mass x. And it's going to come back to the beam splitter. And it's going to pick up the integral, except you know, multiple things are running backwards. And the net effect is another uh, extra amount of time to get back to the beam splitter. It's the same size as the extra time it took on the outbound trip, because we're assuming that h is effectively constant for the duration of out and back. So the total extra time in the round trip is h times l over c. That's what's added to um, 2 L over C for the, the main effect of, of the length. Now, picking up speed here, I'm just in our head, I'm going to do the Y case. The Y case is almost precisely the same, except remember that the, metric, uh, the, the term in that metric perturbation that corresponds to Y has the opposite sign. So every place I used to have an h, I have a minus h. And therefore, if delta t for the round trip times the x arm was h times l over c, delta t in the y arm is minus h l over c. And it's also convenient to talk not about the, not just about the extra time in the x direction and the extra time in the y direction, but the difference in travel times between the two arms. So the difference between this and this is 2 h l over c. The algebra makes sense. The algebra is easy to follow. Raise your hand if it's not. OK. All right. One other pointer. This is not even an interpretational point. It's just a reminder that we don't have to build a simple Michelson. In fact, even Michelson didn't build a simple Michelson. By the time he wrote his 1887 paper with Morley, the original Michelson interferometer written up in 1881 did have just down and back. Michelson didn't have the sensitivity to see the ether drift. So he hired an assistant, Morley, said, your job is to fit eight round trips on this slab of of marble that Rana showed us. Is, it, is that? Oh, granite, right. Yeah, on the granite slab. OK, so Morley invented the multi-pass Michelson interferometer, and that's what made things work. And as long as 
H is still varying slowly compared with the total time it takes to go down and back, down and back as many times as it goes, then the effect is simply to multiply the signal by a factor of a dimen the dimensionless number n that corresponds to the number of round trips, number of round trips. And we call that combination 2nl over c, the storage time. And so now the difference in light travel time between the x arm and the y arm in the multi-pass case has, has this form. Okay, we're almost there. When we speak as relativists, the time difference seems like the natural kind of language to use. But if we want to pivot from thinking like a relativist to thinking like someone who's building a machine, we have to ask what we would see. And there's no stopwatches there. What we're going to do is superpose those two beams. And I will show you in a minute how superposing those two beams reveals not the time difference, but the very closely related thing to the time difference, namely the phase difference between the light and the two arms. So here's the time difference, h times tau store. And now I'm going to convert time into radians of phase by this factor. And so now here is the effect that's almost the measurable thing. And we'll get to the measurable thing, namely the change in brightness, in just a second. OK, so did any of this go too fast? So here's our Michelson interferometer again. Now, what do we do? We are superposing light from the two arms. And when those two beams were precisely in phase, because the arms had precisely the same length, and for now let's assume the magic thing that we can actually set them precisely at the same distance uh, um, from, from the beam splitter, although it's not, it's not crucial that we do. OK, if they were precisely the same in both directions and no gravity wave present, delta phi is 0. And the, um, the amplitude of the field traveling out of the beam splitter towards the, this port here that we call the anti-symmetric port is simply this. Okay. So all of the light, when the arms are the same, all of the light ends up going out the, um, uh, the port at the bottom. And when delta phi is 0, none of the light goes off to the left. But as the arm lengths pick up different lengths, one from the other, phi, delta phi is no longer 0. And we get something more interesting. So. Here is a statement in terms of what we can finally measure, namely the power at the output port. It's the power coming in times the square of the cosine of delta phi because power is proportional to the square of the field. And if you don't like squared trig functions and you'd rather have trig functions that, that aren't squared, you use the trig identity and say, OK, it's p in times 1 half, 1 plus cos 2 delta phi. And when you do this, the same thing to what happens to the power that goes in the other direction, you end up with an expression where instead of cos squared, you've got sine squared. And then we all remember this trig identity that cos squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. Ergo, light either exits downward or to the left in such an amount that power is conserved. Power goes one way or the other, but we've got whatever total, total amount of power. Note that I have not included any losses in this treatment of the interferometer. That's why I can say this such a simple way. So now, here is a diagram that Rana showed you before lunch. This is power as a function of phase difference between the two arms. And if you're close enough to see the numbers, you'll see that for reasons I no longer remember, I used cycles instead of radians here. Um, but it helps you see, uh, see what's going on anyway. So here is a situation where um, I've got 
all the light coming out the output port, none of the light coming out the output port, all the light coming out the output port is a function of the phase difference. And just to make this as connected to our senses as possible, we either have a dark port, a bright port, or something intermediate. And what we do is put a photo detector there and say, okay, what is the amount of light power exiting there? And that is my indication of what is the phase difference and thus the length difference between the two arms. And looking for changes in brightness is my way for looking for changes in arm length difference, which is my way of looking for the passage of a gravitational wave through, through the instrument. So I called this the arm length difference to brightness transducer, and that's what it is. Okay, with me here. On. Okay, so now let's say a bit more about the case where H is not a constant. So we've got a time varying H, but if it varies slowly, then that brightness is going to brighten and dim slowly and faithfully tell us the waveform H. And being able to make faithful measurements of H is of crucial importance to us because separate from just saying, yeah, a gravity wave came, we really want to know the time history of H of T because we want to understand our sources and we want to know the time history of I double dot of T. So for any waveform where the time variation is slow compared with the storage time, we have built ourselves a faithful recorder of H of T. If, on the other hand, as will sometimes be the case, H of t varies on time scales that aren't um, substantially longer than t store, what we have to do is go back to our original integral, the one I did on the board, and say, oh, you know, partway along the way from the beam splitter out to the end test mass, H got smaller. I'd better do an explicit integral of what the value of H was at each time the, that, the, that the light is moving. And I can do that too. But I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it here today. So for the cases where it matters, you can carry out the time dependent integral. And uh, what you find, depending on exactly what that multipass scheme is, there is a characteristic uh, frequency response that says for a signal that's varying um, at uh, uh, a period that's only uh, twice as long as time, I've got this much less response. So we've got, some, in, in effect, a filter. The response rolls off for fast signals. When we talk about uh, Fabry-Pro cavities later this week, I'm going to mention a, a small mathematical miracle that happens. If we were doing beam folding the way Michelson and Morley did it with a discrete number of bounces, then as Rana mentioned, I think this was the point you were making, there are some um, frequencies of gravitational wave for which you get zero response. The ones where um, the arm lengthens in, in half of a period and then it's shrinking the, the other half of a period. When we use Fabry-Perot cavities, there are no such nulls in our response pattern, only a smooth roll-off. This is something that's, that's really nice, really remarkable. So it's not the case that we always track H of T faithfully, but we can always calculate what's this filter function. And assuming we had enough signal to noise, we could always correct for it. We won't always have enough signal to noise, but in principle we can. And uh, I'm belaboring this point because I, first of all, because measuring H of T I think is really important, but B, because it's possible to invent gravity wave detectors that don't have this broadband property, that don't reveal H of T faithfully. And our history is, is, was founded by precisely such detectors. Bars were never able to do this. And you'd, 
kind of see by, by the nature of their construction that they weren't going to do it. The way a bar was finding a weak gravitational wave was to imagine a gravity wave of some particular time history of h of t passing through the detector. And then the integrated effect of that wave on the bar leaves the bar in some vibration state. And the sensor is there to record, oh, I'm vibrating now. And I'm at a new amplitude than I was just a moment ago, or at a new phase than I was a moment ago. But you, but you could only measure the amplitude change of the vibration or the phase change, which was some complicated integral of h of t. But with interferometers, we are, with this caveat, actually measuring the time history of h of t. And that's a really, really nice feature, as long as we have enough sensitivity to actually see something. OK. Now, another thing that, that Rana pointed out quite vividly already, and that he and I will both be pointing out in more detail as the week goes on, is the fact that we don't have access to all frequencies anyway, because we have a large band of frequencies where the noise is huge. In initial LIGO, it was below, call it 40 hertz or 30 hertz. In advanced LIGO, we're hoping it's below 10 hertz. Everything below there, H of t could be anything. We can't see it on those frequency scales. At high enough frequencies, there is a gradual roll off. And at some point, we lose track of the very high frequency details of our signal as well. So even though in principle we have a faithful broadband response, it's broad-ish, but it's not completely wide, wide open. So, so in, in, in actual fact, um, we're only going to measure h of t filtered by a complicated function that includes some information about the roll-off in the arms, but also uh, represents the fact that our noise is strongly frequency dependent and will only make, even in the best of circumstances, high SNR measurements of a certain frequency range of the components of, of H of T. Okay, that's it for the, the mathematical statements of what, a res what the response of an interferometer is. So I want to pause and see if there are any questions that you were too shy to ask a moment ago, but we'll do it if I prod you again. Okay, so it was obvious. Rana. Why do you call them really um, I will anticipate a slide that probably appears here in a little bit, but why not ask right now? Okay, so Rana asks the good question. In what sense can I say that those mirrors are free because they better darn well stay still um, uh, and, uh, or, or else. Here is the meaning of free. Um, each of those mirrors is hung as a pendulum. Now, what's a pendulum? A pendulum is a, a kind of a version of a mass on a spring. What does a spring do? It holds things in place with a, by applying a force if that mass ever moves away from its rest place. What does that mean in terms of this language? For frequencies low compared with the resonant frequency, any resonant suspension, any mass on a spring, any pendulum stays where it belongs and is not free. It's held in place. But at frequencies large compared with the resonance, the response of that mass on a spring or that mass hung by a wire is precisely the same as if there were no force on it. And I'll make this clear in a later lecture. I'll show you that by mathematics. But um, the response of, of, of a mass on a spring at frequencies above the resonant frequency is a so-called mass-controlled response, that it's, it's just the F equals MA part, and the spring plays no role at those high frequencies. So what I mean, Rana, by free masses in this case is that uh, for a gravity wave, whose effects are in the horizontal plane and who's doing things at frequencies above the resonant frequency, the motion of suspended mass is no different from the motion of a mass uh, that's free, literally free to fall. 
And I will tell Rana a story that he may or may not know, that I once spent a half hour on the phone with someone he, whose name he mentioned yesterday, Bob Sparrow, where Bob was saying, well, maybe we'd solve a lot of our problems that come from the suspension if only we dropped the mirrors and then had a gentle catcher and brought them back and dropped them again. Okay? So there was at least a half an hour in the history of LIGO where it was considered to, um, to make the masses literally free. But uh, from, from the face that Rana is making that you all can't see, um, uh, he understands how silly we were to waste even a half hour of two people's time on, on that. Um, but we don't need to, because pendulums are a good idea. And if there's one technological subtext of, the, um, of, of a lot of what I'm saying this week, it's that pendulums are a really good idea. I'll keep telling you why pendulums are cooler and cooler and cooler for this function. But this is, this is their, basic, their basic idea. OK, so now on to interpretation of the math that I just did. So um, this morning before lunch, I was talking in, in a naive sense about, oh, well, the arm lengths change. Now we've worked out, OK, how we can see that it shows up as a time difference, which shows up as a phase difference, which shows up as a power output power change. And now I want to remind you of the sort of odd kind of thing that I said when we talked in relativistic language. I'm saying that the way I used numbers to describe the situation, I'm saying that the masses did not move in the sense that they didn't go from one coordinate to another, but nevertheless, the separation between, between them changed by virtue of the fact that, as we showed, the metric of the space is not just the Minkowski metric, but has a time-varying perturbation. But now, the TT gauge is not the only coordinate system you could use to describe this experiment. You could use coordinates that are marked by scratches on a very rigid rod. And if you lay this very rigid rod next to the interferometer, and instead of shining light through it and doing everything we just did, use a microscope to see where the front surface of that mirror moves with respect to the mark, you would see that the, that the passage of the gravity wave through the interferometer actually puts the mirror at a different spot next to the marks on that rigid rod. So if you define coordinates the way physicists normally do, get out a darn meter stick and lay it down and see where it is, the masses do move. And this is one of the subtleties of general relativity. You would think that there's an answer to the statement, did the masses move or not? Well, that's a that is a coordinate dependent statement. But what's not uh, coordinate dependent is a prediction for what the light will do when it, when it travels down that path. OK. Now, here is the slide where I was going to answer your question. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, this, this, is, this is a highly rigid rod. Okay, but it doesn't even have to be highly rigid to make the point. As long as it's got the ordinary amount of stiffness, we, we, can, we can always treat, if we want to be thinking the way a physicist in the laboratory normally does, I could have written the expression for the effective force that's pulling apart the, uh, the spots at the two ends of the arms. That force is also being applied to that rigid rod, but because it's got stiffness, it stretches only by a certain amount. And it stretches by a lot less than the masses that are free to move. They just go. The rod stretches a tiny bit, but in the limit that I've got the stiffest unobt <coughs> unobtainium, then, um, then I'm making a faithful measurement by, uh, by looking at, at the marks. So it's true, in principle, the rod stretches, but the stiffness restricts it to, to negligible amounts. Thanks for that question, though. That's good. OK. So in advanced LIGO, as Rana mentioned, our test masses will be 40 kilogram mirrors. 
made out of fused silica, and that's important. One of my other themes will be fused silica is amazingly good. Um, suspended from fine wires as pendulums. In particular, in advanced LIGO, those fine wires are actually fused silica fibers because silica is really good, as I will keep telling you in more depth later. And four frequencies that are above the resonant frequency of the pendulum. It's as if that suspension had no effect on the interaction between the test mass and, um, and the mass. So when I do my relativity, I know I'm not going to look down at one hertz, right? And we put that suspension or resonant frequency down where we know the noise is going to be terrible anyway, and then we never have to think about this. So free mass is, is, uh, is a perfectly good description for everything we need to do. Okay, now, where am I in time? Did I run over? Ah, good. Okay, that's right. We started at 4.30. I want to talk about a puzzle that occurs to many people. And finally, it kept, was keeping me up at night. So, so I decided I'd better understand it for myself. Um, and my, my fear was LIGO wouldn't work because of this. It would be an obvious physics mistake. And after spending $300 million, I'd be called in front of a committee of the U.S. Congress and, you know, grilled for missing this, uh, this silly fact. So uh, having to think through this puzzle became important to me in my life. Um, so the question is that it's probably occurred to you, if not, someone else has asked you, asked it of you or will in the future. So is it not the case that the effect of the gravity wave is not just on the masses, but it's also on the light. And if that is true, given that we're using light as a ruler to measure our lengths, do we not have a so-called rubber ruler, one that stretches when, when the arm it's in is stretched, is compressed, when the arm it's in is compressed, and therefore, by construction, we have design something that can't possibly respond to a gravitational wave. That's the puzzle. Now, if you believe the math that I just walked you through, you would say, I just showed you my math that it must work. But it's nice to be able to say things in language other than mathematical language. And sometimes it helps you understand what your math actually meant. And in th this is one of those cases. So I want us to think. Is it fair to say that we're using light as a ruler? Is that ruler being stretched? And would the fact of that ruler being stretched mean that a gravitational wave cannot be observed using light traveling in an interferometer? Or do interferometers actually the work the way I said, and that there's something wrong in the formulation of this puzzle? Hopefully the answer is one or the other. And hopefully it's the answer that interferometers work, or else we're all going in front of that congressional committee. So um, for doing math, I like that transverse traceless gauge. I like marking my coordinates with freely falling masses. They have this very special property there that they're always at the coordinate you park them at. And the metric just does what the metric did, as I described it. Okay, This is uh, a, a choice that is. Uh, so common that it gets reused in cosmology. Co-moving coordinates are to cosmology what this coordinate choice is in the gravity wave problem. If that means something to you, great. If not, it's a throwaway line. Forget it. OK. Um, now, here's where we'll start looking at, um, at the physics. And I want to start drawing some pictures again. Let's see, the eraser is here. OK. Now that I see where the switch is, I can do it again. All right, so uh, let's just think about the x arm. You saw how easy it is to include the y arm later. So here's my input test mass, my end test mass, and in a moment, I'll put a gravity wave in the problem and put some light in there. But I want to supplement these two masses 
that are the ones that represent actual mirrors with masses that could be there, but they aren't. But they could be there, and for conceptual purposes, I want us to imagine that at any place along the arm that I care about, there's a tiny extra freely falling mass whose role it is just to make us think about what space-time actually is. Okay, so we're never going to implement this, but in principle, we always could if we needed to. Okay, so let's fill the arm with a dust of extra freely falling masses to make a pedagogical point. And now, let's imagine that we're running a gravity wave interferometer. We've been shining light in the arms, and that at some instant, here are a bunch of wave fronts of the laser light for the light that's outbound. And there's another set spatially superposed. I won't draw them because the drawing starts to get confusing for the light that's coming back. And I've drawn like every billionth wave front just so we can see them. Um, not, not, not that fraction, but another tiny fraction of them. Okay. And now I want us to think so that we can think clearly of a particular waveform that will let clearness of thought happen best. Namely, I want h of t to be a step function. And I want before t equals 0 for this to be the case. And after t equals 0, I want the arm to be lengthened by the small amount that I've been drawing. And I want to ask the question, what happens to all of the wave fronts of the light in the arm? First of all, as a bridge, let's consider this dust of extra freely falling test particles. What happens to them? Sendel saying, they're all stretched apart. Okay? This one that used to be here is also right adjacent to the front of that mirror. And the one that was just to the left of it is just to the left of it. But their tiny separation has been stretched by that amount. Okay, that makes sense, right? Now, let's consider this wave front. At t equals 0 minus, it was adjacent to that freely falling mass. What must be the case for where I draw that same wave front at t equals 0 plus, right after the arrival of the step function. If this moves to the right, that wave front had better move to the right also, because otherwise, if it knew to do something different, it would have a different access to space-time than, than masses. And that makes no sense. That would be a statement that there's some secret preferred frame that masses in space don't know about, but light does. And that's, that's absurd. Okay? There are no preferred frames. The reference system marked out by this freely falling masses is as good a one as any. Therefore, we know that not only do massive objects get moved apart when a gravity wave arrives, but wave fronts in light also get moved apart. Therefore, it's correct to say that the light is stretched in the x arm if h has a plus sign, while simultaneously it's compressed in the y arm if, you know, for the same sign condition. And therefore, it looks like that puzzle is about to come out with the wrong answer. And we're going to have to answer for this in front of the US Congress. I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Something is wrong. Um, I hope that's not this application. Ah, I know what it is. OK. So the wavelength of light is affected in the same way as we're saying the separations of masses are. So can the interferometer still work? Yes? It, it, no, I, I don't want to agree with your statement that it affects different masses differently. What I, what I, let, me, let me say it the way I'd like it, and then um, let's see if we can come to agreement on, on, on language that we both agree. So 
I don't want to really even assert that this is the mass that doesn't move. What I want to say is all that I care about is separations here. And if I've got a situation where a gravity wave arrives and separations grow, all of the separations of the masses grow. Now, for purposes of drawing a diagram, I might say this one didn't move, but that's not a meaningful statement. So, um, and was, was that the point of your question or was, was there a different angle you're going with it? Yes, it'll be the same for, for whether the mass is a mass of one gram or a mass of 40 kilograms uh, or a mass of a microgram in, you know, in the abstract world of GR before we put in noise forces and stuff. Yeah, but at the level of just gravity, it doesn't matter. And this is a statement of the principle of equivalence, which is a way of saying a fact with more sophistication than Newton, but that Newton knew. Namely, he was astonished by the fact that the gravitational force on some object of mass m was proportional to m. Therefore, every object that you might allow to fall under the influence of gravity had the same acceleration. And we're so used to this, we don't know how astounding it is. But it's astounding or foundational. Okay? So Newton took it as a puzzle. Einstein took it as a foundational principle. And we've got a big name for it, principle of equivalence. But it's basically, it doesn't matter that these are minuscule masses and these are macroscopic masses. They, they show the same thing. So is, is that the, at, at least an answer to, to, to the question? It's OK? All right. So my ruler is stretching. And why my ruler is compressing? Or or not. Um, but, but I want to assert, and I want to explain in a minute how I, can, how I can be confident that even though I just proved that the light is stretched, that we still can make this measurement. First of all, I remember that I could have made the measurement a whole different way. I could have laid a rigid rod down by the side. And if gravity waves have any meaning, I would have been able to see it that way. So un unless I'm wrong on that too, uh, uh, physics is, 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 isn't crazy. All right? But now, let me remind you, if you need reminding, which you probably don't, that, OK, I just took a snapshot of where the light was at this moment, but this light is, in fact, outbound. There's light that was sent in previously that's inbound. At some point, one storage time from now, all of the light that I drew and the light that was also in the arm that I didn't draw will have left the arm. What's taking its place? New light that's being pumped out by the laser. The wavelength of the light that's pumped out by the laser is determined by the length of a, rigid of a rigid resonant cavity inside the laser. And that's not stretched by the gravity wave. The new light has the same old wavelength. The original light before the arrival of the gravitational wave. That's not changed. So if we wait a storage time, then we're doing the measurement with unstretched light. And at least on time scales that are a storage time or longer, the objection of the rubber ruler fails. So the only question is, what do we learn about the response of an interferometer on time scales that are short compared with the storage time? And the answer is, what we've learned is the instantaneous response of an interferometer to a step function is, in fact, null. Okay. Because now I finally want to draw in the wave fronts that were inbound. So here's another set of inbound wave, form, or wave fronts. Okay, so blue light is going that way. So the measurement that's about to happen at t equals 0 is 
this wave front about to be superposed. I'm forgetting that there's a finite amount of space to the beam splitter. Give me, give me that simplification. So there's a wave front that's just about to be superposed at the beam splitter with the wave front from the Y arm. Did this light, did this wave front move to the right? No. Did this one move down? No. They're in the same place because they're right there together at the center. So we already knew that stretching the arms couldn't possibly give us something that we could see instantaneously because there's no, there's no purchase that the gravity wave have on light that's already back at the beam splitter and about to, um, um, uh, about to, to, to recombine by superposition. However, what we do know is those inbound wave fronts are farther apart at t equals zero plus than they were at t equals zero minus. And therefore, the next one takes a little extra time to get back. The next one after that takes a little extra time. And gradually, the response builds up from zero up to the naive DC response over the course of one storage time. And in fact, for an arm that's this simple, the step function response is precisely zero. a ramp from t equals zero up to t equals tau store. So what's the answer to the puzzle? The answer to the puzzle is that when you call light a ruler, you're not remembering how you use the light. You use the light in an interferometer to mark off travel times. And OK, so the light stretches. That tells you that. The effect builds up from nothing to the full naive effect over the course of one storage time, and you're done. Now, we already knew that there was going to be some roll-off from the fact that there's a finite storage time. And here in the time domain is, in fact, a representation of the filter function in the time domain for the response of, uh, of, of a simple arm. So. Do Rana and I have to answer to Congress on this? No. There's no puzzle. Interferometers can work even though light is stretched because we're not using it as a ruler. We're using it in effect as a clock when we use it in an interferometer. OK, so that's the material that I prepared. Are there any questions that didn't get asked already? OK, time for Ollie, right? I'm sorry? Isn't this long explanation a bit too complicated for the Congress? Um, uh, all right, we don't have to explain it to the Congress. We just have to know that we don't have to explain it to them, right? Then we're good. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought of it. I'm sorry, Uni. Oh, short pulses. Right. Okay. Absolutely. That's in effect what I'm doing. By right. I I I don't disagree. No. I I, I yeah. I guess I don't disagree. Except then then once, once we realize that that's true and then we switch back to wavelength language, suddenly if someone hasn't gone through that path of thinking and then back, the puzzle reoccurs until you realize that what we're doing is treating the wave fronts as a set of very closely spaced pulses. Um, and, and, and then you're right, then we've got it. So each wave front in this sense could be considered as, as a device. Yes, precisely. Yes, you've said it very well. Yep, that's it. That's it.
Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, 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 so you would never have lost sleep on it, but I, I assure you, I did for a while. Yeah, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs>